Hello everyone, and welcome back to Gooey's Dungeon Dive, the show where I, Gooey, rank all of the dungeons in The Legend of Zelda, and I'm joined, as always for this season, by my special Wind Waker correspondent, Corey Richmond. Yahaha, ha you found me. In our last episode, we completed the Korok Festival, and we got Ferora's Pearl. The King of Red Lions directs us to the next location for the final pearl that we require. We must set sail immediately as he says. But at this point, we can really set sail. After complaining about the Great Sea portions previously in the series, I was determined to go to every possible square I could, <laughs> except for the destination. And there's so much you can really do at this point. There's so much optional side content to discover. Proportionally to the last section of the game, it's actually quite insane. I thought I took a long time getting to the next destination. I thought I was doing a bunch of stuff and I didn't I didn't go to every possible square I could. I did. I uncovered it all. I kind of limited myself a little bit because there are certain islands where like you can't do the full thing unless you have this item or unless you've started this part of the quest. And something that I kind of kept stumbling upon is that I kept finding things and was like, man, I wish I had bombs. And there was one in particular. It wasn't even like an island. It was just one of those enemy <laughs> outlook things. And I found whiz robes for the first time that circle around it and shoot fire at you. And I kept dying. And I was so determined to be like, no, I'm going to beat these jokers. And finally, I got to the point where I could kill all of them but there's one of them that's just out of reach, and of course we don't have the boat at this point, and I didn't have the cannon, so I just had to abandon ship. There's definitely a few things that I knocked off the list. I, you can visit Tingle Island for the first time. You can uh, kill some big octos, now that you have the boomerang. You can visit a few of the fairy islands, and I think you can access maybe like one of them or something like that. In terms of like required things, we can actually, this is way ahead of like, when the game really suggests it, but at this point you can actually start collecting pieces of the Triforce. We have oh, a quest yeah. involving the Triforce, or the Triumph Forks, as the, the fishmen call forks. them. He's kind of our first hint at, at them, actually. He says he doesn't know what they're for, but it's somehow tied to our destiny. You know, we know what it is from the previous games, obviously, and a lot like the original Legend of Zelda, we're kind of collecting the shards again. So it's a little bit of a throwback. And by the end of this segment of the game, if you really comb the sea, you can find three special charts throughout the area that you get deciphered by Tingle for quite a bit of rupees. But then those show off, you know, special locations that can be salvaged to acquire a shard of the Triforce, which will become very important later. Many people probably will not encounter this yet in the game, especially because it's so mysterious, but I do love this element of the game. That's really just something I appreciate about this and have appreciated about it since I played it for the first time. I don't like when Zelda games kind of railroad you, and th this game mm -hmm. does have its its fair sections of railroading, to be fair, but I like that if you don't want to progress the main story, you don't have to. You could waste time going and doing a plethora of things just to have fun in this world before you even hit the next item on your checklist. Absolutely, and I did really like this part even though it is proportionally so much crazier compared to the other parts, but I do like this element of collecting you can collect this important stuff for later. I like how it's, you know, you can kind of go wherever you want. The only thing that really gets me is I think now looking back on it, that last portion of the sea we talked about. Out of all the other things, I'm that's the most like the biggest hang up I have. And I think if it had built from the first time you sail to, you know, just being a straight line to the second time being like more of a area, less of a just a straight two yeah. lines. Yeah, if it had that triangle that you drew out. Yeah, yeah, my expertly drawn diagram. And then if it led to this, where now it's like, you can go anywhere. And I think if that was different, it would feel like a more natural opening of the world, you know? They definitely could have just opened it up a little bit better. I feel like we're still pretty early on in the game at this point. I like that it kind of opens up and from this point it's like, okay, now if you have the abilities to do the stuff that you find, like, go do it. It only stuck out to me because I felt like this part of the game was actually quite a lot of fun. I think it's definitely constructive to, like, look back and specifically benchmark or put a little bookmark and be like, okay, this was the section, specifically, that made me feel those feelings. Because I think a lot of times people will feel maybe that type of way in only a section of the game, 
Like, maybe we'll get to it later, some people feel a certain way about the Triforce Shard quest, but I think people will sometimes get in a rut in one spot, and then kind of project that onto the entire game, or onto the whole Great Sea, or onto the sailing mechanic or something. When a really, like you're saying, I think it's, it's important to be like, okay, this section specifically could have been handled better. Yeah, I agree with you, and we'll we'll definitely cover more of the Triforce quest later since mm -hmm. it's so important, but I thought it was worth noting that you can begin it here. And this is something that is really a big selling point for the game for me of what makes it special to me, is that there are some games in the series where, let's say I sit down and I'm like, I have an hour to play this game, I'm going to try and get to this point. There are a few games where if I sit down and play, I don't get to the point that I was trying to get to. Some games, it's because the game itself just takes too long. But this game, I normally don't get to where I wanted to get to because along the way, I just keep seeing little things and being like, hey, why don't I go stop at this island and do this little thing? Oh, there's Tingle's Island off in the corner. Why don't I go get that chart deciphered that I got a little while ago? Oh, look, there's a little glowing spot. Why don't I pull up some sunken treasure? That's really special to me when a game can distract me so well off of my course that I, I don't get to where I'm going just because I'm having fun doing other stuff. Yeah, this part kind of scratched a similar itch of like Breath of the Wild where you just like want to start exploring the whole world which is like definitely still is like keeping in line for me with of like what I like getting out of Zelda even thinking forward of like at this point you don't have arrows you can't fast travel at all you know things that you normally kind of want like I think the game even is like really fun despite that you know but eventually our sailing does get us to Great Fish Island which is our destination that's where we're supposed to meet the water spirit Jaboon This island, it's already been attacked by Ganondorf's forces, though, and it's a complete wreck. And we're met there by Quill, who tells us of a curse that has come to the island and now the rest of the Great Sea, which is creating a perpetual stormy night. He informs us that Jaboon has hidden out on our home island, actually, of Outset, and he sealed himself in the back of the island, and we need to find a way in. Quill tells us that uh, he accidentally let this information slip to the pirates, who he thinks may be plotting something. And with that info, we gotta set sail to where they are currently docked, which is back on Windfall Island. What do you think about this big reveal here? The Greyfish Isle, just going there and seeing that this was a civilization that has now been destroyed, I think it's pretty heavy. Even for a game like this that, that appears so light, it's like, wow, this, <laughs> this entire island was destroyed. And I think it serves really well as a story moment. It's funny though, now knowing a little bit more about like the development of this game and stuff, I kind of just view this as like, man, I wish they had kept something here. Because <laughs> there was supposed to be yes. something there, and they ended up just scrapping it for time, which is always a shame in any Zelda game. That does stick out to me. I do mm -hmm. like it. I think it's a really cool twist you know especially because after a link to the past and ocarina of time we're kind of so far the story has been kind of following a familiar beat yeah. and i like that twist of like okay now we're going to the third crystal location or whatever you want to call it pearl you're expecting to find like a town with some people who are having a problem and there's a dungeon there and then you get the next pearl psych Bye. this is like going further in the game and talking about it as a whole which we haven't gotten to but it is kind of a bummer like that we don't get a dungeon out of it you know like i yeah i do feel like the game overall is is sort of lacking in in dungeon quantity like i want to play another dungeon you know maybe there could have been one yeah back exactly. on outset in the cave or something i don't know you know definitely with the extra context it feels like man you know i i wish they'd that's just something I wish so much. And like there have been interviews and stuff with Onuma being like, oh, are we ever going to get those dungeons that were cut? And he's like, man, those dungeon ideas have been incorporated into dungeons already. Like there's not some secret dungeons that we made that just haven't been released. Like those ideas are like done. It's similar to like that Oracle of Secrets thing where it's like what the product is now is way different because that doesn't exist, you know, mm -hmm. with the actual products we got products, but it would be cool <laughs> to see what the game could have been because I feel like the game there's there's still room for more with like 
yeah. the uh, gameplay that they introduce. Like there could be more to it. That could be a lot of fun. There's cool concept art out there too of of stuff that they were possibly planning or things that we could have gotten like completely oh. new islands. So we set sail for Windfall and now like I said the curse that has come to the island has spread to the whole sea and we're sailing off into this endless stormy night. So over on Windfall Island, tensions are high, everyone's nervous about the pirates who've posted up on the island, and we can eventually sneak in into the back of the bomb shop and spy upon these guys as they ransack the place. I adore this whole cutscene. I love it so much. Just the fact of like sneaking into the back feels like something that you were doing in Forsaken Fortress. If you had visited the bomb guy before, he's like, yeah, you want you want to buy this for 10,000 rupees or something like that? So this jerk gets his comeuppance because he's like all wrapped up and struggling and stuff. Tetra lets it slip a little bit here as she shows some genuine concern for Outset Island as opposed to wanting to just collect the pearl for their own personal gain. But the pirates, they don't have the same sense of urgency. They want to rest and get a good meal before setting off in the morning to Outset, which gives Tetra a moment to save face here because when she notices us you know, sneakily spying from above, realizing Link is also on the case. She's like, okay, let's take a little bit of a respite here. Gives a little wink. Yeah, a little wink kind of gives us the chance to, like, catch up. So, you know, we're a little bit more with Tetra, like, there's something more going on with her, you know? They unsuspectingly reveal their secret password for the day, which changes depending mm -hmm. on your game, but it allows us to get into their ship while they take the night off. This is kind of a minor thing, but we get a little bit more of detail for Tetra because we're actually able to go into her room. And yes. I love seeing she has portraits on the wall that show segments of the legendary hero story from the beginning of the game, as well as there's like a C chart with a diagram of the Triforce drawn on it, which mm -hmm. we're going to find out what the deal with that is soon. So I like that there's like been all these like little breadcrumbs along the way that she's like kind of clued in to like the greater lore of the world and like what's going on in the game. And she like that's kind of why she's uh, aiding us. She's not necessarily just like a pirate out for for treasure i think there's like a portrait in there too that has like a woman in it that might be implied to be like her mom or something like that yeah and they look kind of regal we've had her like when we first meet her down on the beach you can tell she knows a little bit about forsaken fortress and uh you know some of her crew like i remember comments on link's clothes and stuff like that so there's some vague interest in like the legendary hero you know yeah down here, we also reunite with Nico, who gives us one more swinging challenge before we get to the bombs. You know what? When I was re-watching our, the, the first episode where we talked about the first swinging, and I kind of felt like it was a little unnecessary, and this time, I was all for it. <laughs> I love the swinging reprisal, and I love that it's okay, slightly we're... harder. I just thought it was really fun, like like an upgrade. Like... He's like, you'll never beat this one. I like Nico's character too, so it's always good to yeah. check back in yeah, on he's him. Funny. How he's I, dealing with, you know, being the swabby again or whatever. Yeah, I like that he's. All the pirates are off hanging out and partying, and he has to hold down the fort at the ship. Another great little bit of foreshadowing with her is that pirate's charm that her and the oh, king of yeah. red lions can communicate through she's actually been kind of keeping an eye on us as she communicates through that pirate's charm she gets a few good ribs in on link you know kind of mm -hmm. takes him down a peg but she also basically spells out what we need to do to get to jaboon the pirates you know plan of blowing mm -hmm. up the wall so she's like the real purpose here is she's basically telling us like Hey, you can go do this. And we can set sail once again, continuing our journey through the Endless Night. The Endless Night itself, the theme for it, it's kind of like a scary remix of The Great Sea, but if you listen closely, there's they also fold in Ganon's theme in there. Like really quiet you can hear ganon's mm -hmm. theme going if you listen for a little bit when you're back on outset obviously the endless night is still going on it's real scary it's real dark and no one's really outside anymore a nice interesting little detail is that enemies start popping up 
on Outset Island. Like chews start popping up in like the regular beach area and then as you go up there's mini blends that start popping down the cliffs and trying to attack you and stuff and it just really gives it adds to that sense of urgency like dang this haven my home is being invaded mm. by these you know these enemies it's very reminiscent of like ocarina of time yeah yep we get a little bit of a chance to check in on our friends and family and if we choose we have a prime side quest opportunity here this is one of the most heartbreaking moments in the game i think when you come back and the endless night is still going and then you walk in the sad music's playing and your grandma's all like sick and asleep having a nightmare Very heartbreaking, but we can save her. We can travel up to the fairy fountain up in the woods, and we can grab a fairy to help uh, our ailing grandmother. She gets kind of a more inspired attitude. I feel bad though, she's like, I'm sorry for being a bad grandmother. I should be taking care of you. And I'm like, no, don't yeah, feel right. bad. Of course we get a great reward out of helping it too. She gives us our favorite soup. Yum, which like heals you, right? I don't. I didn't use it. It heals all of your hearts and doubles your attack power until you take damage. There's two helpings per bottle. Grandma soup is OP. But when we actually get to it, we gotta blast open that seal and go meet Jaboon. This is a pretty cool scene too. I love the Jaboon like theme is like a sweet Wind Waker remix of Inside Jab Jabu's Belly music. It sounds less like upsetting but yeah. and more like ethereal and like yeah. what's what it, yeah. That's really cool. Kind of mystical. It fits the conversation that we witness here. It's sort of one sided or at least like from what we understand. Like the King of Red Lions and Jaboon are talking but Jaboon only speaks in this ancient Hylian, so we're, we're only really getting half of the combo. But you can tell they're talking about, you know, the legendary one, the hero of time. They're kind of implying, like, would this kid be, yeah. basically be able to achieve that? Is this and guy I, up to I the love task? the mystery. Yeah, I like I like that choice of like we can't understand Jaboon. It's like that was really well set up. I liked how they've had all of the the ancient. Yeah, all the deities are speaking the ancient Hylian. We are gifted Nehru's Pearl. And we're directed now towards three islands in the sea where we can place each of the pearls that we've collected on these goddess statues. If you want to go off and do other stuff before you go to the Tower of the Gods or before you place the pearls, like there's a ton of stuff you can do at that point. Right, because the storm is clear and we have the bombs. It does change a lot in the ship. You now get like... Yeah, you get the cannon. I feel like our ship is now like complete. I was drawing comparisons to um, the runes. <laughs> many times how you get those in breath of the wild early on mm -hmm. and then like then you can kind of go anywhere and like do stuff and that's that's why i think about them here is like i feel like at this point in the game even without the arrows and like being able to fast travel like i feel similar to how you do when you get off the plateau and like now you have all these uh items at your expense and like this whole world to explore that's why i draw those comparisons to breath of the wild because i think Breath of the Wild, more so than other games that came after Wind Waker, they both are trying to get back to that idea of like, just go wherever you want and explore the world, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I don't know, I hope we haven't gotten to, um, that's like one of my main overall uh, thoughts on the game. So I hope we're not giving that away <laughs> too soon. But that is like, this moment was the first time I like, truly felt that in this game. When we place the pearls on their corresponding statues, we get this another legendary scene from the game where they all kind of transform into oh, these yeah. magical like goddesses. and they form this giant Triforce across the Great Sea, uh, which is, you know, what Tetra had on her walls. This scene for me, maybe it's just nostalgia speaking, but I feel like up until this point, there hasn't been a cutscene 
like this. A giant behemoth god tower <laughs> ascending from the depths of the ocean. And then of course you get the comic relief of Link getting launched and face planting right <laughs> into it. It would rank high on, uh, there has to be like a list of like best dungeon opening cinematics, you know yep. what I mean? Like this is, I feel like this is the most extreme version of that so oh, far. Yeah. Which is another point for the dungeon, I say, before we even get into the dungeon next episode. But having yeah. a cool opening cinematic definitely helps. <laughs> I completely agree. Setting up the context for this dungeon just really helps set the tone and atmosphere of once we get in and that's something that's incredibly interesting too which i'm sure we'll talk about next time is that this is the only dungeon that you can sail straight into the entrance is in the water yes and we do that and that well we'll leave it there we'll kind of tease it still because that's going to be our next episode the tower of the gods jaboon gives us nay rules he rules Jaboon gives us Nehru's pearl. I can't say Nehru's Nehru. Ne Nehru's pearl. That's a good. That's an outtake. Yeah. Uh, we are gifted Nehru. <laughs> Nehru. We are gifted Nehru's pearl. Yes. Did it. <laughs>